this way So we, actually I should say who, who I am, because everyone knows who you are, you're Kate de Rouge, but I'm your friend, Claudia. You are my friend, Claudia. I didn't want to double barrel my name there. But we actually spoke about this podcast a few months ago, the idea of this podcast. Yeah, so I've been thinking about wanting to tell this story of mine for a little while now. I, I've, um, I've wanted to share it with the world, f- yeah, for maybe a couple of years, but I wasn't quite sure how to do it mm-hmm. um, and I wanted to do it in a really um, authentic way and, you know, in a way that honoured my story and my recovery um, to the best way I could. And I had been thinking about and I, it's amazing how the world works. Your partner, Kyle, is a very good friend of mine and, um, you know, we sat down and we started talking about it and then it, funnily enough you are a podcast lady um, and amazing at it. And so, yeah, it just has, you know, to be honest, I didn't know how to do this on my own um, and that's why you're here um, to help me and to support me um, through telling this story um, until I feel safe enough to sort of do it on my own. And you know what's so funny? I was actually a massive fan, I still am, a massive fangirl when you – when you won Idol. That's so bizarre. How weird is That's that? It's so bizarre. To and then me. the first time we had coffee, like last year or the year before, I remember I was like, oh my gosh, Kate Rouge. And as soon as you started talking, I was just captivated by you. Like, well, you remember, poor, I was like, you poor dear, you would have been like, there's this Kate Rouge Idol girl, and I'm just like <laughs> dumping these outrageous no. stories on you. No, because it was, and it, I remember because I'd seen some, some headlines in the years before. Yeah. And then actually meeting you and hearing you and your story and just like, what you've gone through the last couple of years, but just your whole life story. I was like, this has to be out there. Like people have to hear this story. So I'm so glad we're doing it now. I'm so grateful to have you here. And um, yeah, I'm excited and nervous to tell this story. I think we spoke about it a few weeks ago. Like this will be the first time even to myself I've told this story from start to finish. Um, and look, it's it's not a it's not a pretty story. There's a lot of amazing stuff in it. And, you know, over the years I've done a lot of incredible things, but it's – um. You know, it gets pretty dark and it gets pretty messy and it gets pretty painful. Um, and I and I really just want to share it because, you know, if it can help somebody not feel alone or not feel like nobody understands, um, you know, that was my first step to recovery and to getting out of, of drug addiction and mental health was feeling that somebody else in the world actually understood Mm. who and what I was Um, and also to just help start to remove I feel like in this country maybe we're a little bit um, uneducated in maybe maybe not so much in mental health but in that addiction space and I think there's a lot of judgment that maybe if people had a better understanding of it's not just about these people who wake up one day and take a bunch of drugs and hurt everybody and steal lie cheat and do what they do like it didn't start like that Mm. Um, and there's a whole realm of things that happen before you get there and I don't think you'll find any drug addict or person that suffers with and not just drug addicts but you know like gambling addicts and and sex addicts and people who are addicted to social media and all of these things like nobody sets out to be like that and I and I don't think that anybody in this world sets out to cause anybody else pain but yeah I guess as humans we're um we're programmed to run from pain you know what I mean and and my way of running from pain unfortunately put me in a pretty extreme world of, of drug use um, um, that inevitably forced my hand to look at myself and, and get recovery. So yeah, I just think it's time to share my experiences. All right, so we're going to really unpack this over the next couple of episodes. So let's let's take it right to the beginning. Can you tell me about your childhood, like the, your earliest memories, your yeah, family home, that kind of stuff? Yeah, um, so... You know, I grew up in Bendigo um, in, a, in a beautiful home um, with a mum and a dad and a brother and a sister. Um, there was a lot of love in my family. Um, I had extended grandmas, granddads, aunties, um, and family has always been a big part of my life. Um, we're very close um, and, and I, they're still a very big part of my life, you know. Um, but, yeah, I grew up in a home. There was a lot of love. It was pretty, you know, your normal home. It, like my dad got up and went to work. My mum stayed home and looked after us. And we didn't, you know, we weren't wealthy or rich or or any of that stuff. But we never, you know, my mum always made sure that we, we didn't want for anything. Mm. Um, you know, I had um, 
my mum was, you know, growing up, she was a fun mum. She was spontaneous and we would end up on wild adventures and buying puppy dogs or you just never knew where you'd end up with my mum. Um, and there was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I was the eldest of three. Uh, but unfortunately, for whatever reason, and, you know, I still don't have the exact answers for this, I can't really remember a time growing up where I felt... I guess safe or comfortable, maybe maybe comfortable is a better word. Like mm. I, I never felt okay with who I was, or I just I just always remember having this low level hum of of discomfort and and fear and anxiety. Not that obviously when I was a little kid I knew what those words even meant, but looking back, um, you know, I just never quite felt right mm. in my skin, um, and yeah, that that sort of followed me as I grew like primary school wasn't a fun time for me um you know bullying started really young for me um I think you know I, I don't know if you remember being in primary school yeah. but um you know there was even in primary school there was always that core group of girls that were just like the it girls yeah and they were pretty from a young age like I never got that no. like how are you you know what I mean how do you even know how, how to be your pretty? awkward phase how do you know don't how like to everyone be else. like that yeah, amen. you know what I mean wasn't me and I just desperately wanted to be in that group and I don't know why I thought or understood at such a young age that being cool and being popular was what life was about mm. um but I think I just always believed that if I was a part of that, then I would feel okay and I'd feel accepted. And that was something I chased and have chased. I still chase it now sometimes, you know, to want to just feel cool. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in, I think in grade three, we'll say roughly, um, you know, I had that super important birthday party uh, and I invited this group of popular girls and, um, you know, they – proceeded to come in after recess and rip those invitations up in front of me and, and put them in the bin and, and um that's year three yeah grade three like and that's brutal that's brutal at any age but like it, in year three that kind of like act in front of everyone like so it's so public I don't know that's well it was just brutal. cruel and I guess it, it it just confirmed it was just one of many in many instances and, and many situations growing up that really confirmed that that narrative and that story that I just didn't belong or I wasn't quite right or I didn't fit in um, the way that I thought that I needed to fit in. Mm. Um, like what does that even mean, fit in where? But I'd created this story that for me to be okay I needed to be whatever that was, which is curious to me that as, you know, a grade three, what are you in grade three, seven? Yeah. Um, that I even understood what that, you know, that I needed to be something else. But I think that's so powerful too because there is a stigma of like, you know, drug users or, or addicts and stuff like that must have had like this terrible upbringing or they had this story or like – and you're like, well, no, I came from a really loving home and I had a great upbringing and I had a fantastic parents and grandparents and and I still kind of went that way. You know what I mean? So I think yeah. it kind of takes that stigma away a little bit as well. well and it's, it's confusing, it, right? Like I do remember – even when my drug use picked up later down in the story, like thinking that, like, I don't, I'm not that, you know, mm. um, that stuff comes from broken homes and all that really stereotypical stuff. Um, but it's just not true. Yeah. 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 So primary school was rough. Did it, yeah. did it get better after year three or it's kind of. No, nah, it, it, it didn't. And, um, you know, I was an awkward girl. I, I reached puberty earlier than a lot of other girls. You know, I got weird little boobs. You know, you know, early and I had to wear a bra early and, um, you know, I started to fill out um, a little bit. And I actually remember really vividly um, the first time that I felt that awful feeling that my body was wrong. Mm. Um, and I, I want to say maybe grade five-ish. Um, it was a casual day at school and I hated casual days. Oh, my God, they just still still bring up something in me, the panic of what to wear on casual day at school. But um, I had a pair of jeans on and I remember her saying, like, those jeans are too tight for you. Um, and I just wanted to run home and rip those jeans up and burn them and never wear, mm. you know, never wear them again. Um, and I'm sure I never did. Well, and it's also stuck with you. Like here you are in your thirties, and you like you can still recall, of course, that moment. Yeah, and and I guess that was where that storyline and that core belief um, about body image um, and what I, 
the unrealistic view of what I thought my body needed to be to be, you know, maybe I didn't understand it in grade five at seven or eight years old, but what I needed to be to be lovable. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. When I hit high school, I, I blew out um, in a big way and I, um, yeah, I, I also had a, um, which many, many women will know about, I had an unfortunate thing called polycystic ovarian syndrome, which doesn't help you know that so there's some other shitty side effects from that you know it's really hard to lose weight it's really easy to gain weight you grow a lot of body hair unwanted hair all over the place um and so that in your high school years which again you would remember are pretty important um well they were to me anyway and they just kept me separate again and they just made me different i looked at other girls who had these ideal teen bodies um and I didn't, you know, I was I was a big girl. I put on a lot of weight um, and I had, you know, hairs on my face and just just all of that stuff that just made me want to hide and, and not feel good. I actually, it, it came to me, which I'd totally forgotten about. It came to me the other day, like talk about casual days. Um, I had this black trench coat, right, that I, in my mind, thought that if I wear this coat, no one will be able to see me and I would wear this coat in 40 degree days like oh, wow. I would be hiding everyone would go to school and they'd be I dread it everyone you know girls would be in their shorts or their skirts or their singlets and I'd be rocking around thinking I was hiding mm. um who I was behind this black trench coat which, that's high school that's high school which yeah. you know it actually just draws more attention to you who's this girl yeah this giant girl in this black trench coat in a 40 degree day but you felt safe I felt it. safe and I felt hidden and I felt like if I could hide behind that coat no one would see me before we kind of get past schooling i just wanted to ask you if you could talk to your little primary school year three self you know the invitations that got ripped up what would you say to her now yeah and look i've i've done a little bit of that work that inner child work and we'll talk about that and you know um in the recovery stuff um and in that healing but like i would just I just wanted – that girl just needed to be loved, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and she needed to be loved by herself and that and that was – I would just tell her that she's loved and that I love her and that I I could hold her and it, and I think that's the stuff within a child work. Like it didn't matter how many people told me I was loved. Um, it was that inner inner voice that, that she needed, you know, to just – so, yeah, I would just hold her and tell her that it was okay and that um, it wasn't her fault. So we're in high school, you start singing at some point. I'd love to know where that started. Yeah, so music um, music has been with me forever, you know, and it was my one place, I guess, where I felt um, safe and, and good. And I, my granddad was the most unbelievable tenor um, and had the most beautiful voice and he would just bring you to your knees with his voice. Um, and I, I was very close to him growing up and my family's quite musical um, and there was a lot of music in my home. Um, and I would spend a lot of time, you know, I was a bit of a tomboy. Mm. Might be a surprise to you, but I was a bit of a tomboy growing up. And I loved fishing and camping and, you know, I would go spotlighting with my granddad and we would just sing. Mm. Um, but, yeah, singing was a th- was just that one thing that I, I always had. And people kind of looked at me when, like, in a positive way when I was singing. You know, I would sing at um, – high school assemblies and stuff like that um and you know people would look at me a little bit different through that but music got serious for me when I met Vanetta Fields Mm -hmm. um I met her when I was about 15 um and she's just a bit of backstory on her she's this unbelievable backing vocalist who had an like one of the most outrageous careers she started in America as an iCat um, and two of the world with like Rolling Stones and P- um, Pink Floyd, Fleetwood, you know, all of those big, big names, Michael Jackson, Barbara oh, Streisand, wow. um, you know, she actually, fun fact for you, um, Greece is the word, is the word. Yes. That's her. Yeah. Like that's her singing? That's her voice singing that. What? That was, of all the things she told me, that was that's the one thing cool. I was like, shut up. That is bloody cool. Anyway, I digress. Um, so she became a part of my life. I met her at a dinner in Melbourne. And my dad was with me. My dad's a pretty extreme guy. Yep. Um, he'll go above and beyond to make things happen. And he, he, you know, my my family supported my music always and, and really helped me um, do ev- everything I could to achieve. Um, so, yeah, we met Vanetta and he said, how would you feel if I sent my daughter up 
to you. She lived on the Gold Coast, you know, every maybe two months for a week of singing lessons. And she was like, yeah, whatever, and walked off and was like, that's never going to happen. And um, Was she offering that service at the time? Not particularly, was no. <laughs> she was a singing teacher. She was a singing teacher, but yeah. no, she'd never had some random girl she met at a dinner yeah, in Melbourne. It was like a boot camp that she no. had on the side. And, um, so, yeah, he... Sure enough, I turned up there, you know, maybe a month later on her doorstep as this 15-year-old and we did this intense um, this intense singing boot camp, I guess, and that carried on um, all the way up until I left Bendigo. So wild. It was, it was just random. That's what it is. So at 15, you're going up to the Gold Coast. So obviously singing, it's a natural ability for you. Did you feel like you had to work at it? Because like, I've obviously heard you sing now live a few times and it's just oh, such a beautiful voice. But it was something that just came just naturally from your soul. Yeah, I guess when you're little and, like, I didn't really think about it. It's just something that I did. Um, but, yeah, I guess when I when I first went to Vanetta, like, she's not a, a subtle woman. I won't call her. like one of the most amazing teachers and and the best teaching she did with me. She didn't teach me technical stuff, really. It wasn't about breathing and scales. What she did teach me is the first time she got me to sing a song, she handed me the lyrics. Mm. And she said, you tell me what that song's about before you sing it. Um, and that was how she taught me to sing. She taught me how to tell stories, yeah. um, which is my favourite kind of music to sing. I love, I love telling a story. Um, yeah. But yeah, like I, I don't know. I guess as with most things in my life, like I, I, I knew I could sing, but I, I just, I was never really able to own that space and mm. go, yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm good at that, and feel comfortable to say, I'm. I know I'm good, you know, mm -hmm. despite evidence of, you know, all the things that had gone on in my life, yeah. Was it, do you ever remember a time where you're like, yeah, I'm going to be a singer, I'm going to be a famous singer, like this is it? I think that was always the goal. Like okay. it was always the goal. I wasn't really, like I'm not, um, I'm not academic by any stretch, you know, I'm, I can't really spell. I got asked in year 11 maths not to return for year 12, mm, same. Um, you know, like, I might be able to add some numbers together, but that's about as good as I get. It's like, hard. what even is pi? I don't even know what that is. What language? Who's pi anyway? Um, mm. uh, so, yeah, like that wasn't – academics was – I was never going to uni. That was never going to be my story. Right. Um, so music was the one thing that I knew that I was relatively good at, and I guess I had that support of my family mm. to help push. Um, so, you know, my first – and then, and then, of course, Australian Idol – became a thing you know what I mean that was the first um talent show to hit tallies in a long long time yeah um so you auditioned for the first season didn't you I did I auditioned for oh well yeah the first three yeah, yeah. so what okay so when did you hear about Idol I'm curious to know. I think I think from memory it was the ads you know there was mm -hmm. ads audition for Idol I can't remember exactly I just know there were ads and um you know, everybody's like, oh, you should audition for Idol. And I was like, yeah, I'll audition for Idol. Um, and I would have been 16 um, for my first audition and I wore this really silly hat in my audition. I just remember the that. The paper boy hats? It was like a little, yeah, a little hat. They were the rage though, like the Ashley Simpsons, the yeah, world. Yeah, like, yeah. I wore this little hat. They were cool. Um, funnily enough, I, I actually remember going shopping for that audition and, and not fitting in any of the clothes, you know, um, Sorry, that was just a memory that popped back. I remember that really stressful shopping was such a stressful time for me because mm. it was like not that tiny teen body size and I had to shop in older women's shops that had bigger yeah. sizes and I, I just remember the stress of getting to that audition was everything and it was life. Like I, I, I remember the weight of what that audition meant at that time. It was like if I don't get in, like my world's going to end. Um, yeah. Was that first audition for the first season in front of the judges or was that producers first? Yeah, so it's, it's um, as you know, like there's not a lot of reality in reality TV. So there's a whole process that happens um, before, uh, before you get to the judges. So there's like this, and, you know, with Idol, they took the best of the best and the worst of the worst. They really showcased those poor people that maybe didn't really have a lot of talent, mm. bless their little hearts. I think they do that across all the talent shows, don't they? Not The Voice. Okay. They don't do that on The Voice, which okay. I do respect. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, they really was like the best, the best and the not so fabulous ones, bless them. Um, but, yeah, so I got through that first that first bit of, you know, I was obviously good enough to put in front of um, the judges. Um, so that's the first, the first process and then you come back for a really long day of waiting to step in front of the big lights. 
unfortunately, um, and this is a really common theme through this story, um, unfortunately, a lot of my big moments and a lot of stuff that's happened in my life, I don't have a lot of memories of. Like mm-hmm. I, um, I, I became really, really good at, at living in this state of disassociation from myself. Like I just was on this survival mode all the time. Like I would be so anxious and so fearful and so worried about what the world would say or what you would think of me. Like I wasn't actually able to be present. I don't know if you've ever done it, but have you ever been in a conversation where you're too busy worrying about what somebody thinks mm. of you to actually be able to be in a conversation? Yeah. So that like, like dates, like first dates, yeah, that like, kind of feeling where like they're just staring at me or that they're seeing my flaws or you can't even think about what's yeah. really being said because you're too busy worrying about the last sentence that was said or what he's going to say next or mm. what he's thinking about or what I look like or what my arms look like in this top or whatever it is that you're obsessing over that you're not actually able to be in that moment. And that was my whole life. Mm. Um, So, a lot of really beautiful stuff that happened in my early years and my adult years, I don't remember a lot of the finer details because I was just in that hypersensitive survival, get through this moment feeling. So, I don't remember what happened um, in the idol auditions per se. I just know I didn't get through. (laughs) I just know know they said no. Sure. Um, And, you know, especially that first one when I was 16, there was so much importance put on. I was like, if I don't get through this, like my life is nothing. Yeah. Um, That I just, you know, that first just wanting the floor to open up again and just to be swallowed whole and just to disappear. So I rang Vanetta, this woman who had never had any um, children or, you know, she was a single woman who, who had lived her own life and toured the world, I rang her and said, hey, what would you think about me coming to live with you um, on the Gold Coast? And she took a minute and she was like, yeah, all right. So she actually sold her house that she was living in in Currumbin Valley and relocated closer to like um, surface and, and the yes. main hub of it. And her and I coexisted in this house. And was she pushing you to audition the third time? So I was actually, um, I got a bit distracted, um, surprisingly, up there. And, you know, my weight had gone up and down and, and all of that stuff. Um, and so I was I was a bit off the idea by the third time. I actually, to be honest, I was in Noosa and I was a bit hungover from memory. And she called me and she was like, get your ass to Brisbane and get to that audition. And I was like, nah, look, I just don't, I'm not ready to hear no again. Like, yeah, fuck that's that. Fair. And I'm, I'm, you know. You 18 at this point? Yeah. And I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd got distracted by, by fun and life, um, you know, but I, I went because when she said stuff, I generally did it. Um, so I, I went to this audition. That's I just want to give you kudos. That's quite courageous a third time at 18 you've you've already heard no and i don't want to rub it in your face Ugh. but you've already been rejected twice really yeah. from this show and you go back a third time at 18 you're like no i will do this again like i will sing for you i was and- like all right i'll go i'll give it a go and, and look the, and and what she said to me was really great she said just go and see like go yeah. and see where you're at see if you've improved see um you know if the if the if the marks changed and so i probably went with a bit of a different attitude um, you know, maybe I didn't, I didn't care as much. That's it. And maybe your vocal cords, you know, were relaxed because you didn't. I don't know. I, I don't know. The I don't know is here I am. <laughs> Do you remember um, what you, what song you auditioned with? Uh, yeah. Time? So I, so I got through. Um, I got through that third, which I'd done all the other three times. You know, I'd got through all the other two times. Sorry, I'd got through to the judges. Um, so I sort of geared myself up, um, and when I did the long day waiting to, you know go see the judges and and um the song i sang that year was young hearts oh great song yeah young hearts run free which is still one of my favorite songs um i love that song very very much but yeah i um i went in and it's a long day man like there's and you watch everybody go in and there's so much energy and i Again, remember like, having all of these singers around me like doing their warm-ups and their big notes and their big runs and like being full of confidence and not shy to like be out and extroverted in front of this room and I'm just sitting in the corner like, fuck, these people are good. Yeah. There's no way that I, I can get through here. Like I can't, I can't, I can't do what they do. Um, and, yeah, obviously that the third time was a, a slightly different experience. And so you get through to the judges. Yep. How did you feel? I mean, obviously we've touched on, you know, you've you got some body insecurities still going on. Do you remember how you felt in those initial auditions in terms of like yeah, how you felt in your body? Again, like I know that I just felt 
uncomfortable like I did and I and I just I just hate I just I fucking hate the way I look you know what I mean and I've hated the way I've looked for as long as I can remember and that's always in every every big moment of my life that's a part of it you know what I mean that's that's involved in my memories which is shit Mm. um you know instead of walking in and, and again being able to be present and and of course you're nervous like everybody gets nervous but um you know I I'm so aware of my body um, and when I'm feeling really insecure, like I can get as zoned in on how my body looks like I can feel how much of my ass takes up a seat, you know what I mean, or I can feel how tight my clothes feel. Like I just feel like it's just it's always in the forefront of my mind. So, yeah, you Mm. know what I mean? I went in there and I I felt my fashion choices probably weren't awesome. You know, fashion's not one of my strong points. and I think. But also the fashion back then wasn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't awesome. Yeah, it wasn't. But I'm pretty sure that got brought up in my audition by Kyle. Um, in the audition? Yeah, afterwards. I'm, I'm pretty sure when they all said yes, which obviously shocked me and put me on my ass, I was like, what? Mm. Um, I think I forget his exact words, but he basically told me to look better when I came back that, for and the that top was, 100. Right. Okay, so that was the initial auditions. Yeah, that's that's that first in front of the three in the, the three judges. Look better. Be, I can't, that, that's something like that. Something like that. Yeah. But the general gist was, this is not good. Because it's quite a big thing for someone who's struggled with their, you know, body insecurities and, you know, you're saying about the binge eating and stuff. And it's quite a big thing at 18 that you put yourself out there on national TV. It, and a great thing, I should say. It's a brave thing because you were like, it, there's such a dichotomy between being like self conscious, but then also being literally on a national stage. You know, like yeah. did that go through your head at all? Or were you just kind of going through the journey of? I, I think I well, firstly, I, I probably, for obvious reasons, didn't expect it to go any further. Either. Yeah, like I don't know. I guess I wasn't thinking about that at the time. Um, you know, and and as we'll go through the idol experience, like you, I, I feel like I just switched into this autopilot setting. You know what I mean? It was yeah. like something clicked, and you just sort of get through that survival mode of just getting like we'll just get through today you know what I mean yeah. and then we'll just get through this afternoon it's so weird to hear you say that you don't like how, how you look because I'm literally across from you right now and I've got great self-esteem but I'm looking at you your eyes are captivating the beautiful blue color like you're just a stunning person how do you get great self-esteem could you I could we do a talk I suffer from my self-esteem <laughs> it's a burden but and then and, and to hear you this stunning woman in front of me being like I hate the way I look I'm like I actually can't comprehend that in my head because I'm seeing you yeah but isn't that interesting like how we all can see or hear or be a part of the same thing or experience and see it really different like I look at myself and go you've got dirty lines on your face from like frowning or smiling too much and you know it's and the one thing I've learned about my body is like I'm probably the most comfortable that I am with my I'm not going to say I love it because that's too fucking big but mm. like I'm going to say I'm I'm the most comfortable I am right now with my body um but one thing I've learned and I've been anywhere from 130 kilos to 60 kilos and all of the places in between and I've, I fucking hate it the same no matter where I am yeah. and I and I look at it and it looks the same to me no matter where I am and yet if I didn't know you and know your story and I saw you walk into like a bar or a restaurant or like whatever, I'd be like, oh, wow, she's beautiful and she must know it. You know yeah. what I mean? And like that's objectively how – and I'm not just saying it because you're my friend or because we're recording a podcast, but like I genuinely feel that way. So it's, it is wild to hear that. But it also shows, like you're saying, it shows that it's more of an internal thing. It's it doesn't all, matter what people it's, say. It's all the internal chat, you know what I mean? I can see a girl – who looks, who could be exactly the same body, shape, size, whatever as me, and she'll be wearing an outfit and I'll go, wow, she looks amazing. Mm. But if I put myself in it, I go, you're repulsive. I'm repulsed by you. Yeah. And that's just that, how old am I, 37 years of of dialogue that I've that's become a core belief of mine. Um, that's a lot of unlearning too. Like if you've been thinking that for 37 years, like I don't know how you. Well, I think I think I... I read somewhere that I think it's about 25 that your brain stops um, developing and that rational part. So, mm. like, uh, after that, what am I, 10 years down the track from that and I've got to un- – it's, it's, it's a hard message to unlearn. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so you get through this season. Season three is the season for you. 
right? You're 18. <laughs> it really was. Yeah. <laughs> We're in. We've yeah. made it past the gate. So talk to me about because it's you go through the top hundred, is that right, initially? So yeah, it's it's a process. So you get through there's that big long day where you get your golden ticket, um, you're in the top one hundred. Um and then, yeah, so you it's a week. So you pack up your bags and you're off to Sydney um, and you're, you're in the process of, of getting to that top, I want to say 25. Do they pay for your flights? I'm so curious. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I think so. I, well, like, I, certainly, was, I certainly wasn't paying for okay, them. Good. Okay. I had no money. Someone paid for something, and they put you up in a in a hotel, um, and it and it's it, it's an in, like it's intense. So it goes maybe there's three or there's th- it's there's three stages from there. Golly, this will rack my brain. There's three stages, three different auditions that happen from there. So you go, you do um, a group performance. Um, I think with a group and then they pick out the ones they want and then it takes you to say the top 50 or the top 75. Then it's a all sing in a line together, um, step out oh, and sing your song. So scary. It's terrifying. Bet, it's, as you're saying it, I'm getting nervous. It's like and then you're in a big theatre and you're in a line and they're like, right, you step out and sing your song. Um, and I sang a Whitney song. I was like, thought I had all attitude and shit. Um Queen of the Night was the song I sang. And I stepped out. I got the stuff that you want. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I stepped out and then that happens and, and then they select the ones that they want out of that line and then there's the last audition um, where you have to come out and sing a verse and a chorus or maybe, I can't remember, maybe a minute of a song. Right. Um, and I sang a song, Randy Crawford, Street Life. How's that go? I play the street life because there's no place I can go. It was a really random song and I think Marsha liked it. I think that was why. I got, I anyway. Love, I love this 18-year-old had all this soul, like young hearts, Whitney. Like. That's Vanetta. She's like, we're not singing Britney Spears I here, right? I love that. Um, this, this all sounds terrifying so far, I've got to admit. And then I add on like, so you're doing you're stepping out in the line, there's hundreds of people around you. But then I also add on the fact that there were cameras on you as well. And producers, like, bloody producers. <laughs> producers are the worst. <laughs> bloody producers. The worst. And there's producers up in your face like trying to get that out of you. Like how do you feel? Yeah. What's going on? And you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know anything. But I, I guess it, for me maybe it worked in my favour. Like I was so in shock that I was there and I think there was just that thing of me that I was like, oh, well, this has been fun. Like this is the end of the line for me. So there was never that expectation of moving forward to the next next one. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, I, it was just it was just my time, I guess. And then, um, as I said, maybe it was an attitude shift. Maybe it was that I was in autopilot. Maybe it was just that I had some talent. Bloody hell, who would have thought? Yeah. Um, and that's still hard for me to say. No, that was good. Um, but, you know, maybe it was that I just was good enough. Yeah. Um, um, and then I cut, maybe a few weeks later you, you get brought back to Sydney and you do the first round of live singing where it no longer becomes the judge's decision. It's, it, oh. it's pub, it's, now it's out, it's out there and it's live. Again, I suffer from high self-esteem and at that idea of putting yourself out there. That made there, me feel sick. Like, that- just brought up some stuff for me. Did it? Yeah, like I I can't remember how many. It was I think it was over like 4 weeks the top 25 get split into groups and you all go out and you sing on this stage. Oh, you sing on this stage live to cameras for the first time and you've got to pick your mark and the red light comes on on the camera and they're like eyeball that camera and like there's so much information for somebody who's never been on TV before. Um plus the added thing of these three judges sitting there and um yeah it was my it, it was my turn and i um i i remember sitting in this waiting room and side of the stage and it was my turn to go out and it, oh, oh, i actually can feel the vomit in my throat now it's it's and i just i remember andrew g or osha sorry was standing next to me with James Matheson and he just put his hand on my back and he said, you'll be right, mate, and he just gently pushed me out and that was it. And that was top. That was So that was top 25. That was the first That was the first live performance to get to the last bit and, and that was um, – that was it. So two people from each, each week got selected to go through mm-hmm. to the top 12. Jeez, okay. So then we're gonna we we'll start with the lives. 
in the next <laughs> episode. Where I'm going to really- need a break before we go there. Because <laughs> I imagine that's kind of like where it ramps up again, right? Well, that's where shit gets real. You know, that's when it. That's when it's, yeah, it's real and, and the story starts to get a bit juicy. I have bad days, I have sad days Don't know why some days I just cry I'm so empty, I am useless What's my purpose, my place in this world? It feels like I am all alone And it feels like I'm the only one I've got the weight of the world on my shoulders Wearing me down to the bones on my knees And I hope and I pray but there's never an answer To why I feel this way Tell me why do I feel this way I have low days I have slow days I have days when I can't get out of bed It makes me anxious Makes me nervous I feel ugly and old in my skin The doctor said it's all in my head So they drug me And they sent me back to bed I've got the weight on Tell me why do I feel this way So give me a reason so I'll keep believing The storm in my head's gonna break Yeah, that rain's gonna wash all these feelings away So the sunlight can shine on my day Let it shine shoulders wearing me down to the bones on my knees and I hope and I pray but there's never an answer to why I feel I've got the weight of the world on my shoulders wearing me down to the bones on my knees and I hope and I pray but there's never an answer to why Tell me why do I feel this way? Tell me why do I feel this way?